Inflation is a bigger risk because it's here. It's real. Inflation is very high. All the Gulf states are meeting. I've indicated to them that I thought they should be increasing oil production generically. So the central bank on the monetary side is going to act according to the mandate. There's a mindset at the Fed that sees inflation as a psychological problem rather than a monetary problem. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Friday, the 1st of July. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Markets bruised. The S&P 500 suffers its worst first half in over 50 years. Europe starts the second half, painting a mixed picture. Have we reached peak inflation? Well, Deutsche Bank warns that rising prices are likely to send Germany into recession. Eurozone CPI is due in 60 minutes from now. Plus, a quarter century on, while President Xi visits Hong Kong to cement Beijing's control, as the city signs in a new chief executive, John Lee. So first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. And there was a little bit of anxiousness out there. Again, concerns about not only inflation, but inflation spurring monetary policy to be more aggressive than anticipated. And that means a downturn in the economy. This is what, of course, a lot of the investors are worried about today. And this bout of risk aversion is rippling across global markets. If you look at stocks, they're down. U.S. futures also down. But it's actually bolstering bonds in this pretty ominous start to the second half of 2022. European stocks and three tenths of a percent. The focus is, of course, on basic resources, the biggest sector uh, that's losing the most, and then copper down some 3.2 percent. Now, if we have a sector map, and this will be extremely interesting to see not only uh, the eurozone CPI as a whole, but if we break it up, for example, what it means for Italy. We've just had some manufacturing uh, PMIs out of the euro area pretty much as expected. I mean, I think this is a second reading. Preliminary, we had 52. Anything above 50 means it's an expansionary territory, and it's 52.1. Now, we are seeing a little bit of difference, again, maybe because of the proximity or because of um, the closeness of how much of um, for example, the energy price they use, but that wouldn't make sense too much. I mean, the DAX is down two tenths of a percent, the FTSE as well, but actually you can see the CAC 40 um, is flat and then the IBEX getting some four tenths of a percent. So maybe some of the quirks because of some of the earnings or again, uh, some of the exposure of basic resources. FTSE 100, extremely rich in basic resources, which is why it's falling more than the others. Now, as we enter, in the second half of the year, let's take a look at some of the headline figures from the first six months of the year. The S&P 500 is down about 21%, the most for such a period since 1970. European stocks capped the biggest sell-off for any first half since 2008, falling 17% since January. And the Japanese yen has become the worst performing G10 currency in the year to date. Now it's down 17% against the dollar. Bitcoin has seen its worst quarterly loss in 11 years, tumbling 58% and the London Metal Exchange index is down 14% in the year to date, capping the worst quarter for metals since 2008. Well, here's what some of our guests had to say looking to the next six months. This is a point of great uncertainty. Uncertainty. Big uncertainties. Uncertainty around inflation. Some significant changes since the pandemic. Transition point in the market. How far rates are going to have to rise. The Fed acted way too late. For the second half of the year. The big question now we have is on growth. Question is now on earnings. Margins must come down. The market will have to fall further. Volatility is likely to persist. We don't see the uncertainty in the other markets going away. We need a different strategy. We still have a long road ahead. Well, joining us now, Andrew Pease, Global Head of Investment Strategy at Russell Investments, and also with us, Lynn Thomas and Bloomberg's Managing Editor for EMEA Markets. So thank you both for joining us. Lynn, so much going on. I mean, first, if you look at the first six months, it wasn't, I mean, it, it, it was pretty horrific, actually. You kind of yeah. forget, you know, when you put it into context, what's it mean for the next six months? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those 2% moves every day have really added up. Um, I mean, I think, you know, just from listening to, you know, the investors that we talk to and the strategists that we speak to, you know, there's a common view that the worst is over, but it's not, it's going to be a rough road ahead. And I think, you know, you know, we've heard a lot of people say until you hear the Fed turn less hawkish, it's hard for people to get optimistic about this market. Yeah. And Andrew, I guess one of the other things that we need to look at is, you know, was this correction just the beginning? What's your take on that? Well, again, it's, it's always hard to tell with these things, but 
I do think that the difference is that this is well known. If you think where we were at the beginning of the year, we didn't know that Russia was going to uh, invade Ukraine. We didn't know how high inflation would rise. We didn't know how aggressive central banks would be. We know those things now. Uh, we know that sentiment's pretty oversold. So these are all sort of slightly comforting things. Of course, there are a few different scenarios ahead, but a lot of the damage has already been done. What does it mean, Lynn, for, you know, if you look at, if you're a trader or a market participant, is it every day just about inflation and whether even if we don't see a recession, it's earnings recession or what could be the catalyst going forward? That's interesting. I mean, I think in the next couple of weeks, it's definitely going to be earnings season yeah. and what people are talking about inflation and how we see inflation starting to eat into yeah. profits or companies able to maintain that pricing power. Yeah. Um, and you can clearly look at the move in commodities today and almost wonder, is the recession story starting to trump the inflation one? Yeah, and that is, you know, the, the million-dollar question, Andrew. Do you do you think we can avoid a recession in the U.S., in Europe, and the U.K., or are we going to see a stagflationary environment? Well, I, I think it's. I think the best thing is not to have strong views either way. Like I don't. I know that everyone's predicting a recession. I know that this is the most anticipated recession I can remember in my 30 years in the markets. Um, but it, it it may not happen. And it, it's interesting just how much the data has weakened in the last few months. When, when particularly the Fed, even though it's been tightening, hasn't got anywhere near where it thinks its neutral rate is. So I think that there's a fair bit of uncertainty. A recession doesn't have to happen. Of course, it's a much higher probability than we've seen already. We do know that in core inflation probably has peaked. Commodity prices are starting to come back down. And if the labour market does start to soften a little bit through the next couple of months, particularly if the participation rate starts to pick up again, there are yeah. scenarios under, under which we do avoid that worst case outcome. But Andrew, even if you know the headline inflation has peaked, how aggressive does the Fed need to be to get inflation at two percent? Will they stop at nothing? Well, it's always hard to judge central banks in this phase because I'm sure Jay Powell means that when he's talking about how, how challenging the next couple of meetings are going to be and they will move aggressively, at least for the next meeting. But central banks do have to talk a bigger game than they really want to play. They're in the expectations management game. So it would be surprising if Jay Powell was to come out and say, look, guys, we're not going to go that hard. Of course he's going to say that he's going to move aggressively. That doesn't mean he won't. But I would always take central yeah. bank talk with a little bit of scepticism. Yeah, I certainly had 90 minutes with a lot of the world's central bankers and they didn't want to give much of a glimpse of what, how they were voting or what they were doing. Um, Lynn, talk to us a little bit about the bond market. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the interesting thing we've been seeing this past few weeks is that how many companies are pulling back on sales, mm -hmm. how many companies are saying this is not the right time to come to the market. And I think it really speaks to the level of uncertainty that you're seeing and that companies don't want to make big financial decisions. So they're going to pull back on IPOs, they're going to pull back on bond sales, M&A deals perhaps being put on ice mm -hmm. until, you know, there's a little bit more confidence in the economy. I mean, again, I guess overall there's a word from central banks about this de-anchoring of expectations and that probably happens if there's a lot of wage increases. Is this the earnings season where we, we know if there are any wage pressures? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, hopefully we'll be able to get some color out of that. Um, I mean, clearly, especially in the UK, I mean, you don't have to just look at the strikes um, that are happening to see those, those wage pressures um, front and center. And I think, you know, for the big companies, it'll be really interesting to hear what they have to say. Yeah, Andrew, I know a lot of our guests had to be sedated because Heinz is no longer selling to Tesco because they wanted to pass on price increases and Tesco said that's unjustified there's no way so they've pulled their prices for now I mean, if you look at you know I'm not uh, maybe we should comment about Beansgate but are we going to see this a lot more in the UK because of the microcosm of this economy well the UK is in a really challenging position right now because the economy is under pressure price pressures are still there it's got supply side constraints so it's hitting capacity at a much lower level of output than seemed possible um, a year ago so Yes, and, and the, the story for companies is that the worst case scenario is that companies are losing pricing power right at the same time that their cost base is being squeezed. And we know that what makes valuing equity markets so challenging right now is trying to work out what is going to happen with margins. And if margins do get squeezed, that is a challenge. But having said that, if I look at UK large cap equities, they're still by far the cheapest of the major markets. Yeah, but if you have interest rates going at, and I don't know where you see interest rates going by the end of the year in the UK, what does it mean for even some of these large caps? Well, a lot of the UK large caps, particularly those in the FTSE 100, don't get many of their revenues from the UK economy, so for them. So it's more an issue for the 250 is where yeah. the challenge come from. 
But it is interesting, isn't it? Because this is going to be one of the stories the next couple of months. Our economies are slowing. The U.S. economy is slowing. What does that do to this to, to the central bank reaction functions? We've already seen Andrew Bailey step back up from some of his more hawkish statements. And one of the interesting points is going to be whether Jay Powell follows suit or not. Thank you so much to you both, Lynn Thomas, and their managing editor for EMEA Markets, and Andrew Pease, a global head of investment strategy at Russell Investments, stays with us. Coming up, energy suppliers are piling up losses by being forced to cover missing Russian volumes at high prices on the spot market. And well, that's having a knock on effect to companies. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, energy suppliers are piling up losses by being forced to cover missing Russian volumes at high prices on the spot market, and that's having a knock on effect to companies. Germany is in talks to bail out energy giant Uniper to stem broader fallout from Russia's moves to slash natural gas deliveries. Meanwhile, Siemens is actually taking a $2.9 billion kit on its stake in Siemens Energy, a turbine maker that's being squeezed by surging energy costs. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's executive editor for energy and commodities, Will Kennedy. So, Will, first of all, how much pain can some of these companies go through and where do they clear out? There's a lot of pain here and there's a lot of pay coming. If we look at Uniper specifically, Francine, uh, they are having to spend 30 million euros a day by some calculations to cover the short they have in gas from the lower pipeline supplies from Russia. They're only getting 40 percent or thereabouts of what they normally get. So they're having to uh, replace that on the spot market to supply their customers. Over a year, that's 11 billion euros. It's unsustainable, um, and that's why uh, they've had to seek the help of the German government, and we've seen the share price crash, as you point out. Are they one of the more prominent ones? Yes, they're the single biggest uh, buyer of Russian gas in Germany, but will they be the only ones who need state, state help? We'll see. Mm -hmm. But clearly, I don't think they're the only company that's going to have this issue this winter. And a lot will depend on two things, uh, what President no. Putin decides to do about gas supplies to Europe and how cold it is this winter. Yeah, but for example, for someone like Uniper, I mean, what's the solution? Because, it, it, you know, it's very difficult going forward to see how this company could operate. Well, I think I, I think there are, t there are several solutions that are open to Germany. Um, and Uniper, none of them are particularly palatable. Uh, they will have to pay what they have to pay to get the gas, and they will have to seek uh, perhaps government help to help them do that. They will have to lobby Germany, and this is perhaps on the cards because it was part of their second emergency mm -hmm. uh, energy plan in Germany, to pass on some of that extra cost to their customers uh, who are currently pr protected by long-term contracts. They m may need to get customers to share the pain, um, and ultimately, they will need to ask customers to use less gas and to find ways for customers to lose gas. Gas maybe incentivize them to do that. Um, worst comes to the worst, they will have to say to customers, we don't have all the gas you need. Um, so there are a range of things there. As I say, none of them are particularly palatable, but they're going to have to employ some combination of them. Um Will, thank you so much for joining us. Our energy, of course, uh, team leader, Will Kennedy. Now, let's stay on energy and bring back Andrew Pease, the Global Head of Investment Strategy at Russell Investments. Andrew, I know we were talking about the fact that if you look at the FTSE, it's quite commodity rich. These are companies that are not dependent really on inflation or consumption in the UK, and so maybe that's where you find value. How much market dislocation are you expecting in the next six months? That's a really challenging question. Like the FTSE obviously has been one of the more defensive markets, and it's going to come down to a lot what we see over the September quarter of this battle between slowing um, growth, how much inflation comes down, whether the labor market softens, particularly in the US, and how central, central banks react. So for now, we're not doing anything. We're quite neutral right now, but we're looking for those opportunities to maybe look for a more cyclical recovery because. In our process, and we have a cycle value and sentiment process, sentiment is deeply oversold right now. Investors aren't panicked, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they're deeply concerned, which is often a very good contrarian indicator. But the challenge, of course, is just working out what's going to happen next with, this, with the cycle part of that process, because there are scenarios for the cycle. But I caution against saying that, yes, we are definitely going to a recession. That is a high probability scenario, but not the only one. 
And what's high probability? 80% or 50-50? Oh, it's, it's less. It, it would be at, at worst 50-50 right now um, because we know that um, households and businesses' balance sheets are quite, are quite good. It just And if inflation really is coming down, we're seeing the rotation away from goods into services in the U.S. We know U.S. durable goods prices are on a downward trend. Uh, so we know core inflation has, with high probability, already peaked. And it's just a matter of how far it comes down, and that will depend on the labour market tightness going forward. So I wouldn't be too sure about saying a recession is going to happen. I think it's much more likely than normal, but it's not the only possible scenario. Yeah. Andrew, how do you play China right now? Yeah, China's super interesting, isn't it? It's had a nice bounce just recently. I would just be waiting because I think a lot of things right now are a dollar story. So we know that the, do the dollar is almost as expensive now as it was heading into the mid-1980s. So it's not quite at plaza record levels, but it's, it's had a big run. It's up 9% this year. And we know that so much is correlated with the dollar. So if we do get a less hawkish Fed, we do know that's mm -hmm. going to weaken the dollar. And if we get that combined mm -hmm. with some Chinese stimulus, we know that's going to be great for EM and it's mm -hmm. going to be great particularly for Chinese equities. So I think you have to wait for that scenario to play out. But if that scenario does play out, EM will certainly be one of the big winners. Um, Andrew, how much in a portfolio sh should people either have gold or cash, though, given... I know y you seem to suggest that the market has been oversold, that actually, the I guess, there's a, if not panic, there's too much concern about a recession out there. But how do you protect yourself if you're wrong? Well, it, 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 it's hard. It's been the worst environment I can recall for investing where you've got bonds and equity selling off at the same time and cash gives you significantly deeply negative real returns. So effectively, there has been nowhere to hide. There really is nowhere to hide. You've just been getting into places which have been least bad, like staples and markets like the FTSE 100. But beyond that, it's very challenging right now. Not even gold, I think, is going to be a great diversifier going forward. So I think you have to go back and think about your longer term um, return assumptions and just um, stay neutral through this next three to six months and see what happens coming out of it because the market is down over 20% already. I know in a typical bear market it may fall by up to 30%, but we just don't know how those scenarios are going to play out right now. So as challenging as it is, what we're doing with our portfolios is we're sitting tight, we're staying at our, at our strategic allocations based on yeah. our long-term markets assumptions and we're rebalancing it and we are debating what that cyclical outlook looks right. like. Andrew, thanks so much. Andrew Pizer, Global Head of Investment Strategy at Russell Investments. Coming up, we'll move from metals and oil to wheat and coffee. How are supply chain snarls impacting soft commodities? The Lavazza Vice Chairman Giuseppe Lavazza joins us shortly to discuss all of this and much more. This is Bloomberg. Finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. On a visit to mark the 25th anniversary of Chinese rule, President Xi Jinping says Hong Kong has been reborn since he last visited five years ago. In Xi's first trip outside the mainland in almost two and a half years, he said the one country, two systems formula will ensure the city's prosperity and stability. The Chinese leader also attended the swearing in of former police chief John Lee as Hong Kong's new chief executive. Now, Ukrainian officials are said to be exploring the possibility of debt restructuring and funding options are at risk of running out. According to Bloomberg sources, multiple scenarios are being considered and no de decision is expected until the end of August. Ukraine has until at least September when it faces a $1.4 billion redemption and interest payments. The U.S. Supreme Court has restricted the Environmental Protection Agency's authority to curb greenhouse gases from power plants. The 6-2-3 ruling is a blow to President Joe Biden's climate change agenda. The majority said that the EPA can regulate power plant emissions but cannot try to shift power generation from fossil fuel plants to cleaner sources. And a former Apple lawyer has pleaded guilty to insider trading over a five-year period. Gene Lebov admitted profiting from confidential 
revenue and earnings information. During his decade-long career at Apple, Levov was responsible for enforcing the company's insider trading policy. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Happy Friday, Francie. Yeah, happy Friday. I feel it has been like a long week for the markets. Actually, it's been a long quarter and a long six months for the markets. Now, we look at it longer term. We also look at the moves uh, today. There is definitely fear that what central banks will do will spark a recession. We also had softer than expected U.S. consumer spending and inflation data, and that really have been bolstering the view that sharp Fed interest rate hikes will spark a recession. This is a backdrop, so we're seeing risk aversion rippling across global markets, sending stocks and U.S. equity futures lower as uh, bonds um, actually are getting a boost. Coming up, oil prices ease on recession fears, putting the benchmarks on track for their third straight weekly losses. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Well, markets bruised. The S&P 500 suffers its worst first half in over 50 years. Europe starts the second half painting a mixed picture for stocks. Have we reached peak inflation? Well, Deutsche Bank warns that rising prices are likely to send Germany into recession. Eurozone CPI is due in 60 minutes from now. Plus, a quarter century on, President Xi actually visits Hong Kong to cement Beijing's control as the city signs a new chief executive, John Lee. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Friday, the 1st of July. It's Friday, so happy Friday. It's the 1st of July, so I know a lot of Americans watching are then getting ready to celebrate the 4th of July holiday on Monday. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Arabica coffee futures are higher with the soft commodity facing dwindling supplies. Certified inventories, according to ICE futures, have fallen by as much as 12.5%, hitting levels not seen since the turn of the century. Now, joining us now to talk about some of these softer commodities, and then we have a, a great interview coming up, is our Bloomberg's metals mining and agriculture reporter, Archie Hunter. Archie, great to have you. So what are the causes of the decrease inventories? Is it structural? Um, thanks, Francine. In a word, yes. Um, so last year, Brazil, which is the world's biggest exporter, had a terrible weather year. We saw uh, droughts and then uh, once in a generation frosts that damaged harvests and um, also some plants kind of irreparably. So what we had was lower production last year and we're going to have less good production this year. And that's why stocks are not replenishing the way that they might have otherwise. So, Archie, what are some of the effects that we're actually seeing from these higher Arabica prices on the behavior of consumers and manufacturers? Sure. So um, one thing is, look, higher prices, you'll see it on your high street chains. Um, coffee prices are going up and consumers are, you know, buying a little bit less. Um, the other thing is that uh, manufacturers are switching more of their blends to Robusta, which um, is used more in sort of high, highly caffeinated drinks uh, like espresso. And um, that's slightly cheaper. We're seeing those blends coming in slightly on the sly, but um, it's something to watch in terms of prices as well. Okay, wonderful round. I was going to say, gosh, not Robusta, but I'm kidding. I'm just trying to wind up. Uh, Giuseppe <laughs> Labazza is sitting next to me. Archie, thank you so much for the roundup. Archie Hunter. So let's get into the conversation on coffee, coffee prices, consumption, and also a bit of tennis because it is Wimbledon after all with Giuseppe Lavazza. He's vice chairman of Lavazza Group. Giuseppe, first of all, I absolutely adore talking coffee. I drink coffee. I talk coffee. and This is huge business. So thank you so much for, for coming on. I mean, we talk every day about some of the supply chain issues. We talk, of course, about inflationary. Like, how does it feel at Lavazza? Are you able to increase prices? Are you able to, to offer consumers what they want? Uh, we are really living a very difficult time because uh, the price of uh, coffee uh, rose very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the middle of 2021 uh, due to a big frost affected Brazil. Mm -hmm. So price of Arabica and Rabasa double in just yeah. uh, a couple of days. And then many issues related oh. to the supply chain, shipping, cost mm -hmm. of energy. So a lot of costs rising uh, everywhere. So we try, of course, uh, to keep the company very competitive yeah. and not to transfer to consumer the burden of all of these uh, increases. 
But how do you do that? So I know you have, you know, some of the prices in London have gone significantly up. I'm not speaking about Levath in general, but, you know, you go out for a cappuccino or an espresso. So how, how can you do that? Or do you make margins on other things? No, we try, of course, to uh, have a very tight uh, budget control on overheads, first of no. all, so to try to absorb part of the cost increase uh, inside the company. Of course, the company is not listed, so we don't have any pressure uh, regarding our margin. No. So except to reduce also margin for uh, maybe a couple of years, trying no. to keep uh, our product very competitive. No. Uh, just a small part of this cost increase is passed on the prices uh, towards consumers. So uh, where do you see the, the, the biggest demand you know, coming from, or where do you see growing the most? Can China, you know, traditionally a tea drinker, uh, nation, you know, switch more to coffee? In 2021, uh, we saw a lot of growth in consumption uh, uh, all across the board, in all geographies and all countries. But for Lavazza, the most important uh, geographies still remain in Europe, United States, yeah. uh, and recently also China, where we signed a very interesting joint venture with a big partner, Yam China, aiming to uh, open uh, a coffee shop chain of about uh, 1,000 coffee shops uh, in China for 20. 25. And, and they drink what? The, the long Americanos or the espresso? I mean, in, in Italy, like coffee is a religion, which is why I always say I'm half human, half coffee. They love very much uh, Italian style coffee. So, in our coffee shops, we present a range of products that are very linked to the Italian tradition, mainly espresso, cappuccino, mm -hmm. cafe macchiato, and many recipes that we are offering uh, to the Chinese mm -hmm. public. They're very interesting in trying them and uh -huh. they like it very much. Who's your biggest competitor? Do you feel like you're a competitor to Starbucks? Oh, yes, of course. We have uh, large competitors. We, we need to grow the company because we know that our competitors are big players as Nestlé, JD, Starbucks. Uh, so for a coffee company as Lavazza, the main purpose uh, is to be more international, to be stronger, of course, and to try to reach a size in terms of revenues and geography distribution. Uh, pretty much stronger to survive and to grow again. So how difficult, and again, this is actually, for, I mean, for me, it's quite difficult to measure, right, from, because usually you have a good, you know, sense if, like, inflation's going up, you have a little bit less money, you cut this, you cut that. What's the relationship between consumers and coffee if inflation is starting to take hold? So if inflation stays at, like, 6 7%, do consumers cut back on coffee or do they go for cheaper brands? The demand is still very strong. Okay. So for, for the moment, for the time being, we see that despite the price increase, the coffee demand is pretty strong. Yeah. And what we are seeing is that the away from home market that was crushed by the pandemic now is bounced back okay. and recovering quite a lot. But different situation for the coffee consuming offices mm -hmm. because many people still are working remotely. So we are expecting that maybe this market is going back uh, during the 2023. But you know, coffee is a global beverage and people like it. So they accept a small increase, but I don't think they accept it to have a, a diminution in terms of yeah. quality. So we try, of course, to keep our uh, mix with high quality coffee without blending, as was mentioned before, with the Robusta. We don't okay, accept don't to do that. No, don't no, blend. zero. I was going to suggest, given the amount of coffee drinkers we have in newsroom, newsroom is like a prime. You should go around the newsrooms and sell more coffee because people are, A, in the office, and two, given the news flow, always need to be extra caffeinated. Okay, talk to me about Wimbledon. So you're actually here because you're one of the, the main sponsors of Wimbledon. D does it help elevate your brand or is it just a personal passion for Wimbledon? No, no, absolutely. In, in, in the company, we divide the family passion from the business <laughs> needs, that completely different stuff. So Wimbledon is an incredible stage uh, to perform, uh, to engage consumer at a very high level. It's the demonstration how UK is very important for Lavazza. We signed the first uh, partnership uh, with Wimbledon in 2011, yeah. and now we have renovated the partnership until 2025. Yeah. So it's a perfect platform for communication, uh, for, for showcase yeah. uh, our capabilities in offering the best coffee and at the same and time a great show. Yeah, and Giuseppe, and, and suddenly, like, the UK, A, are not only coffee lovers, but they actually have really quite good coffee around the UK. Do you have any staffing issues in the UK? It does feel like some of the concerns that we've been talking about in the rest of the world are, are kind of, you know, distilled in the UK and, and so amplified. UK is a great uh, coffee market. Uh, really, it's, it's a wonderful uh, surprise for uh, Lavazza. We started in, in, in the 1990, many years ago, yeah. and we followed this great development joy for, for English uh, consumer to uh, embrace more and more uh, 
coffee and a high quality coffee. So premiumization, uh, specialty coffee, excitement, excitement about uh, exotic origins. This is part uh, of the British uh, coffee culture, very strong and deeply rooted. Yeah. So it's a good basis to think that this market can be grown anymore in the future. Um, Giuseppe, so when we knew you were coming on, my producer said, make sure you ask Giuseppe at what time he stops drinking coffee. <laughs> so is it a myth that you have to stop at 12 or, or 2 no, p.m.? No, 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 absolutely. We say that, uh, you know, the right number of coffee you have to consume in a day is no less than three, but no more than 33. For <laughs> so you can stay <laughs> you just in the middle. That. So every but day, you, every time, every hour. You must switch to decaf. <laughs> no? Is there not a cutoff point where you say, look, I drink, but decaf? The decaf is, is a very good decaf. Uh, Lavazza is producing and offering <laughs> a very great decaf. So if you Lavazza decaf, I say, yes, that's great. Okay, fabulous. Giuseppe, thank you so much. So you go to decaf, right? Also, yeah, why not? Oh. <laughs> Giuseppe Lavazza, there, <laughs> vice chairman of Lavazza Group, but pretty quite coy on how much he consumes in terms of coffee. Coming up, uh, President Xi hammers home the importance of one country, two systems on the 25th anniversary of China's rule of Hong Kong. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, let's take a look at some of the things to watch out for today. At 10 a.m. UK time, the June CPI reading for the euro area is released. That's a big one, so watch out for inflation. Also at 10 a.m., we have CPI data from Italy. Then at 3 p.m., we'll have some data from the U.S., including construction spending and ISM manufacturing. At 5 p.m., first quarter GDP figures from Russia are published. And then a little bit later, the Czech Republic takes over the rotating EU presidency for six months, while EU commissioners gather in Prague. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash with Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bank of America says Tesla is likely to lose its position as a dominant electric vehicle maker in the U.S. to GM or Ford as soon as 2025. In the company's annual Car Wars forecast, it says competitors are set to release a barrage of 135 new electric vehicles. Tesla's share of the market could fall to about 11 percent by the middle of the decade from over 70 percent today. Now, pret a is planning to expand into India via an agreement with Reliance Brands in what the UK-based sandwich chain says is its most ambitious global finance partnership so far. As many as 100 pret shops are expected to open in India over the next five years. And Siemens is taking a 2.8 billion euro hit on the declining value of at stake in turbine maker Siemens Energy. The sector has been hit by rising energy costs and disruptions to the supply of metals. The German industrial giant owns just over a third of Siemens Energy. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, Xi Jinping has hammered home the importance of one country, two systems, as Hong Kong's new chief executive was sworn in on the 25th anniversary of Chinese rule. Hong Kong enjoys a unique position, favorable conditions and broad space for development. The central authorities fully support Hong Kong in seizing the historic opportunities presented by our country's development and in aligning with national strategies. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann, braving the wind, braving also some of the celebrations with the music in the background. Yvonne, how will Hong Kong change from today onwards? Well, I think what we're looking for some answers to that question, Francine. I guess we were short on the details. Uh, but the message that we heard from President Xi was an optimistic one, something that was very different from what we heard from him the last time he was here in Hong Kong back in 2017. At the time when we were starting to see more of these political protests emerge, he talked about what anyone that goes against Chinese sovereignty uh, uh, over Hong Kong was, quote, impermissible. Now he's talking about a harmonious family 
will always prosper, how Hong Kong is always on his mind. But then again, if anyone was looking for any kind of details on policies, uh, we certainly didn't get that in this speech. But he did mention a little bit more about how Hong Kong was emerging in this new stage from chaos to governance, sort of a, a swipe on Carrie Lam and a tumultuous term that she had when we have seen political dissent crushed pro-democracy mm -hmm. opposition lawmakers in jail waiting to go through a trial and also talking a little bit more about the balance between markets as well as the government. We've heard this before in Xi's speeches, uh, but then again, what does this mean for Hong Kong's laissez-faire government too? So the future of Hong Kong as an international hub still remains unanswered there. Yeah, and, and Yvonne, I guess, I mean, it's extremely significant, of course, after, you know, will he come, will he not come, will he come? President Xi is actually in Hong Kong. Do, does it signify that they want to have even more of a stronghold in Hong Kong? I think it was certainly a, a, a signal that he sent, right? As you mentioned, his itinerary was almost a bit of a mystery before he stepped in at the high-speed rail coming from Shenzhen. But the fact that he came after nearly 900 days where he stayed in the mainland uh, and also the, you know, it certainly was a signal that this was a sort of a cautious trip, but one of, he wanted to project this message of unity that Hong Kong is important to him, that this was about domestic support and, more importantly, stability, that Hong Kong has essentially been reborn after the storm from the ashes, he says. Uh, that was the comment that he said yesterday in one of his first speeches, that he wanted to project that we have pivoted into something that's more about economic development now and more about trying to find a, a, a sort of solutions to social issues. For example, housing very much front and center here. So maybe this is a sign that perhaps we could be seeing more of that. These real estate tycoons that essentially have a tight grip on the real estate market here. Maybe it's time to address this wide income and wealth gap here in the city. So, Yvonne, first of all, do, how much do we know about what John Lee's priorities are and, and how, I mean, if not flexible, you know, what his thinking behind it is? Right. So when you talk about, you talk to people here in Hong Kong, uh, we know that he is, has a career in law enforcement, right? He, he was a former police chief. Uh, he was also the head of security and the one that oversaw the implementation of the national security law here in Hong Kong two years ago. But then again, you speak to foreign chambers that try to have, have had conversations with John Lee, and they say he is a pragmatic guy. He is willing to listen because he doesn't have that track record in finance with the economy uh, when it comes to social issues like housing. So maybe perhaps that is a positive sign that this is a restart for Hong Kong. In terms of priorities, we mentioned about housing. That certainly is going to be a key question also when it comes to COVID. If Hong Kong needs to maintain that competitiveness as an international mm -hmm. hub, a lot has to do with how they can set themselves apart from China's COVID policy and whether it has the autonomy to do so. Yeah, extremely, extremely interesting, interesting times for Hong Kong and, of course, the whole region. Thank you so much, Arvon Man, there at Hong Kong Harbor on the ground. Coming up, well, we might not all be going on the summer holiday. Travelers in Europe are paying even more for a plane ticket with less chance of actually making it to their destination. How's that for a depressing Friday outlook? We look deeper into the travel chaos in today's Big Take. That's com coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, never before have passengers in Europe paid more for their summer flights while facing the real risk of not even making it to their destination. Now, from London to Amsterdam to Berlin, chaotic scenes are playing out at airports as a fine tuned interplay between check in desks, security personnel, and baggage handlers unravels on a daily basis as the world moves on from the pandemic. Well, joining us now is Sid Phillip. He's our aviation and autos reporter. Sid, after our horrific coming back from Portugal with a team where you don't have, ba like, baggage handlers, I mean, none of the, um, you know, luggage actually got off our plane, where you don't have enough custom services, I mean, is it just going to be, like, a summer of misery, or will things slowly get back on the road? So the airline industry is definitely hoping to get a summer of recovery because summer of misery really doesn't work for them after two years of virtually no travel. <laughs> Not in the summer. Exactly. Summer is when they make all their money. And so airlines have been ramping up staffing, 
uh, airports have been ramping up staffing and governments have been stepping in where they can. In Dublin, for instance, the Irish government has said that the army is on standby to help with security staff because security queues are long at the airport. Yeah. So this is a sensible way. Like, if you need baggage handlers, like, why did people, is it the fault of, you know, the airlines that instead of furloughing people, they just got rid of them? Or is it people that have, you know, just looked for another job because they were fed up with what they were doing? So it is a sort of combination of multiple factors. Essentially, airlines did have to cut staff at the height of the pandemic because at that time there was virtually no travel, no sort of source of re revenue coming in. And so airlines did make hard decisions at that time. At the same time, governments are arguing that there were furlough schemes at the moment, at that moment for airlines to tap into and they sort of cut back too deep. And so that's really where the major problem started yeah. from. And then you also have the sort of thrown in the factor of rising mm -hmm. cost of living and higher inflation and yeah. staff are talking about uh, striking right. work. And that's really all added up into multiple factors. Sit very quickly, because we're laughing about me sending my kids like the Michelin, like with, you know, 16 layers so that we don't have to do check-in baggage. Is there any way of minimizing it? Is there an airline that does better? Is it an airport that has, you know, it's, it's things together? How long is a no. piece of string? I mean, it is every day. <laughs> it's different airport, different, a different airline. And so it is really sure. difficult for the airline industry. There you go. Good luck to you. And actually, just try not to check in luggage if, if you want to arrive at your destination. Thank you, our Sid Philip Barr, Bloomberg Aviation and Autos reporter. Now, if you would like to delve into today's Bloomberg Big Take, also just type NI Big Take on your terminal or visit Bloomberg.com. In the meantime, so we keep, we're keeping a very close eye for example, on Paris airports, where there are also strikes, of course, so the cost of living uh, impacting uh, the uh, people trying to get more um, and, and actually a wage increase. Brace also for more bad news on the inflation front. The big indicators today will be Italian and Eurozone CPI out shortly. Well, joining us now is Simon Kennedy, Bloomberg's executive editor for economics. And we're just going from good news to good news. So we worry about travel and we definitely, definitely worry about inflation. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to see that uh, data coming out shortly um, from the from the eurozone the forecast. 8.5%, uh, almost four times what the uh, the European Central Bank tries to target. Um, so certainly a, a source of stress for Christine Lagarde and her colleagues. But is there, Simon, should we really worry that they seem to be so data dependent that because of the time lag where you implement monetary policy, they're always actually going to be behind the curve in one way or another? Yeah, and that's the, that's the task for them. The, the, I would say that with the European Central Bank, which is running a negative interest rate, it's getting increasingly harder to, to maintain credibility uh, with, a, with such high inflation, with a, with a negative interest rate. And uh, certainly it seems that there's some urgency there uh, within the central bank to, to get out of a negative territory, um, perhaps, perhaps even as, as quickly as next month, but certainly, uh, certainly by September. Uh, and then after that, there seems to be some debate uh, among economists about just what comes next. Uh, Bloomberg Economics, for example, pointing out this week that a lot of the um, mm. a lot of the pain, the inflation pain uh, for the eurozone, which differs from elsewhere, is that it's energy led, yep. uh, led um, and, and what the central bank can can do there is is limited yep. uh, versus the U.S., where a lot of it's demand led, and obviously that needs to uh, to be to be pulled back a bit. So it's it's going to be a tricky one. A lot of people saying yeah. that a recession by the end of this year in the eurozone might force the uh, ECB to uh, to slow its uh, its hiking campaign. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, recession towards the end of the year, at the same time people asking for wage increases. Bloomberg's executive editor for economics, Simon Kennedy, joining us this morning. Now, this is what the markets are looking at. They worry about recessionary risk. I know they're on tenterhooks for those inflation uh, figures coming out very, very shortly. Now, coming up, more Bloomberg surveillance early edition. It continues with Matt Miller, Kriti Gupta in New York, our Anna Edwards here in London. This is Bloomberg. Central bankers are finally being a little bit upfront about what that actually 
having to deal with. That view that we could see recession over the over the, the winter months has become a little bit more commonplace in the market. The markets are starting to smell a economic slowdown, which I think is a little premature. If we could bring down gas, oil and gasoline prices, we might actually be able to avert uh, some of the worst parts of the recession. We're not there yet in terms of calling the bottom. It's all about how deep a slowdown and how deep an earnings pullback we could have. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kriti Gupta in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Kaylee Lines is off today. Our top stories, an ominous start to the second half of 2022. Stocks and U.S. futures are lower on recession fears. Big short money manager Michael Burry thinks we may be just about halfway through the market decline thus far. Xi Jinping defends his crackdown on Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. The president of China says the former British colony should focus on its economic development. And Vladimir Putin orders a giant oil and gas project transferred to a new Russian company, essentially forcing out foreign partners, including Royal Dutch Shell. So with that said, let's take a look at uh, how the markets are shaping up this morning. We'll start off in Asia with Kriti Gupta. Kriti? Yeah, Matt, see. let's certainly talk about this kind of risk off sentiment that you did see in Asia across the board, really. You saw this across the Asia uh, region. It's not just in China, but in the Nikkei, of course, taking the brunt of it. But it's the Taiwan index, that semiconductor manufacturing that really took it on the chin. If you actually look at the Chinese index as well, you did have some manufacturing manufacturing data there as well. It did slow down a little bit. So once again, those recessionary fears very much baked in to the stock action there. But let's also look at the currency action because that's where you saw perhaps a little bit more strength, specifically in that dollar yen story. The yen strengthening, perhaps reversing some of the kind of record highs or record weakness, I should say, that you saw in this past week. And of course, as you see that record weakness in the Japanese yen, it really brings to the forefront weakness you're going to see in other export ec economy currencies. So things like the Chinese yuan and also the Korean yuan. That once again, again, also reversing in today's session. Anna? Pretty. Let's have a look at where we are on the European inflation story because inflation is still incredibly topical, of course. And we just had data breaking here in, uh, well, for the Eurozone as a whole and also specifically over in Italy. And both of these pieces of data have come in higher than expected, higher than estimates on the inflation front. We're back to talking about higher inflation than anticipated, not by much when it comes to the euro area measure as a whole. The June inflation rate rising to 8.6%. The estimate was 8.5%. We're still talking about inflation above 8% in the Eurozone. The Italian number for June, the CPI number rising 8.5% versus what was an estimate of 7.9%. So we are still being surprised to the upside when it comes to the inflation prints. A, a little bit of a movement higher in the euro, uh, but not a huge amount to take on the dollar strength that we see elsewhere this morning. Let's have a look more broadly then at the European story. And, and you can see a picture of green actually, or just saw a picture of green behind me in terms of where stocks are. And Matt was talking about the weaker picture for equities, and that is true when you look at US futures. But they've paired those losses as we've been going through the European uh, first couple of hours of trading. And and European stocks have certainly paired losses and now are pretty flat. So the stock 600 sitting uh, almost entirely around the flat line. Other assets in focus then today, we've got copper prices moving lower and copper prices actually falling below $8,000. A pretty bleak signal for the global economy. We see copper uh, um, uh, amongst the metals and the metals actually telling a very different story to energy in the first half of the year. So uh, lest we confuse the two, of course, copper prices had their biggest drop in the first half of the year since 1996, whilst a lot of our attention, of course, was on oil and gas prices which were moving higher the pound I put in as well because we've got this uh, strength to the dollar and despite the fact that risk assets have uh, rallied a little bit here in Europe we still see some dollar strength this morning up by two tenths of one percent on the dollar index and ASM International this is one of those companies Matt that uh, it makes huge lithography machines the machinery that makes the chips and this particular business selling off today in conjunction with a lot of other tech names here in Europe on the back of those micron numbers that came overnight all right so there's a comprehensive look at Europe. In terms of what we're seeing here in the U.S., S&P futures are down a little, just about a third of 1% right now, but maybe as we saw so much green on the screen in Europe, we could see a bounce here today. Investors are buying 10-year uh, debt, pushing that yield below 3%. This is a level that a lot of people have been watching very closely. Right now, we're just barely lower than that at 29945. And NYMEX crude actually coming back a little bit. So you saw a lot of those commodities like metals, um, and you 
saw chip makers are down, but crude is up $1.50 a barrel, at least for Texas Intermediate to 107.24. So not a very high level considering where we've been, um, but bouncing back a little bit today. The same is true with Bitcoin right now up about 4% to 19,521. And of course, it's been swinging around a lot. But if this is uh, a correlated asset, if we're seeing gains like this, maybe uh, and gains in Europe, maybe we see a pickup uh, in terms of U.S stocks as well throughout the morning. Critty? Yeah, well, Matt, it's interesting because you're on that board, you have Bitcoin, it is higher, but I also have to say something else you really like to talk about is car makers, which brings me to what's coming up ahead today. We're expecting second quarter figures from General Motors, Stellantis, and other U.S. and non-U.S. car makers. We'll also get U.S. data, including manufacturing PMI and construction spending as well. And of course, across the Atlantic, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and Council President Charles Michael join other EU commissioners in a visit to Prague. Matt? All right, so Treasury is beginning the second half of the year on the front foot as recession fears mount. That's really the top story today. Ten-year yields fell below 3%, as I just showed you. Bloomberg's Danny Berger has the details as we begin the second half of the year. Danny? Yeah, the question's been asked a lot. Have we finally seen the peak in yields? Uh, for a radio listing audience, I have a one month of the U.S. 10-year yield, and it's almost basically where we started the month in June, this the first day of July. Now, part of this goes back to what I really like Emmanuel Co. over at Barclays put it, that stock selling off, Tina is over. There is finally an alternative. Now, it might not look like stocks have finally capitulated or investors there, but it certainly looks like capitulation in Treasury. So people going to the perceived haven um, of U.S. Treasuries. The other factor here could be this turn in inflation expectations. It's really remarkable to look at five and 10 year break evens. They are at the lows for the year. That's a lot of faith in Jerome Powell and co that they're going to be able to get inflation under control. It also might have to do with commodities looking like they are finally turning on fear of demand. So that's the story with treasuries. And I might as well wrap up here with the complete opposite of full faith and credit in the U.S. government. That's, of course, Bitcoin, which does not have that. Matt, you pointed it out. Uh, we are seeing a little bit of a bounce back in Bitcoin. This morning, at one point, it was up over 21,000. Um, so this is the five-day view I have for a regular listening audience. Yes, it's down on that measure. But starting to get a slight pickup, El Salvador's president said that they bought 80 Bitcoins uh, late last night. So perhaps, you know, perhaps there's capitulation here as well, maybe it's not just treasuries, but of course, there's there's so much volatility in this and it's, it's mm. really hard to gauge. I thought it was volatile a couple of weeks ago and then I looked at what it was doing just yesterday and overnight. <laughs> Incredible volatility yes. on uh, Bitcoin. Thanks to Danny Berger for a rundown of some of the big market moves we're seeing. Now over to geopolitics and Chinese President Xi Jinping says Hong Kong must endure leadership by patriots and that there are no reasons to change the one country, two systems in Hong Kong and in Macau. His visit leaves key questions about the Asian hub's future unanswered. He spoke in a landmark speech on the city's 25th anniversary of Chinese rule. Hong Kong's political power must be in the control of patriots, as is true all over the world. China's jurisdiction over Hong Kong is the basis for Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann, who joins us well, from Hong Kong, of course. And Yvonne, uh, what were some of the key takeaways from Xi's speech? From an international perspective, a lot of people uh, watching this commitment to one country, two systems, but af asking if the two systems are really very different anymore. Yes, there's a lot of questions about that. In fact, people were hoping for some sort of answers on policies, whether it's on COVID zero policies or even just what this means, that the second half of this 50-year experiment of one country, two systems. We didn't quite get that. In fact, it was a lot of rhetoric that we heard from President Xi Jinping. Uh, and given that we are in kind of a middle of a typhoon right now, you know, President Xi Jinping really was focusing on the pivot of this political storm that Hong Kong has been in for the past two to three years and saying that Hong Kong has basically been reborn from the ashes, that we have reached stability now after two years to the day that this national security legislation was imposed to the city, where we have seen political dissent essentially been crushed. You have pro-democracy opposition leaders and lawmakers that are still in jail waiting to be on trial, not to mention this overhaul of a new electoral system where only patriots are allowed to take positions of power. But then again, there was this focus on prosperity, this talk of 
governments and markets be more well balanced? There's a lot of questions on what this means. Uh, is this a message to some of the real estate tycoons out there? Um, their tight grip they have on the real estate market and whether they need to start really addressing and alleviating this wide income wealth gap we see here in the city, the world's least affordable market. And in terms of just overall housing, that's the key issue here, the social issues and the economic development, which President Xi really tried to stress in his speech today. Yvonne, how significant is it that President Xi is there in Hong Kong right now? I would say quite significant because even before he stepped foot in Hong Kong, we saw him emerge from that uh, rail, uh, the subway from the, 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 the West Kowloon station here in the real high speed rail. His itinerary was quite a mystery. We, in fact, did not know if whether he would actually show up or not. So the fact that he did, after nearly 900 days of being in the mainland China, he has not left the country since the early days of the pandemic is something. In fact, it may have shown that he wanted to show his presence here as a, a form of strength, a message of unity. In fact, in his speech, there was quite a warm, positive tone that we heard from him talking about how, you know, he, his heart has always been with Hong Kong. He says a harmonious family always will be prosperous. So this certainly was a stark contrast to what we heard from back in 2017, the last time he came to Hong Kong at a time when there was political protests on the streets, when he talked about how anyone that spoke against China's sovereignty over China was, quote, impermissible. It seems like today okay. the message really was about rebirth and stability, which is key. Avon, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Yvonne Mann reporting from Hong Kong. She referenced a typhoon. She wasn't speaking metaphorically. A literal typhoon skirting the edge of Hong Kong. We thank Yvonne for braving those winds for us. Uh, now, let us uh, turn to the subject of Russia. Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered a giant oil and gas project transferred to a new Russian company. That could lead to foreign partners like Shell being pushed out. Anne-Marie Hordern, uh, uh, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now from Madrid. Anne-Marie, bring us up to date. Well, this is the Sakhalin uh, 2 natural gas field, and basically what President Vladimir Putin is saying, because of economic and national security interests, it will now be formed into a new Russian company. So basically nationalizing those assets. The issue is there's a number of companies, including Western companies like Shell, Shell specifically has more than a 25 percent stake in this field, that potentially could lose all of their assets without any payment for them. So this decree is pretty harsh for the business community and for these Western companies. A number of them are trying to offload these assets. Potentially, a lot of Chinese state energy companies are interested in them. But overall, besides the ins and outs for these companies, this just creates a more volatile marketplace. You already have fuel prices higher, and now you're going to have Vladimir Putin, who we've already seen, use fossil fuels as a weapon and he's used them as a political weapon, now having more control. And that could potentially more volatility to the overall market. So uh, the president also says he wants Gulf allies to boost oil production. He's not talking about the Gulf of Mexico, right? Uh, he's talking about um, Saudis and the UAE. Yeah, he was re referring to the GCC, and he's having a trip uh, just in about a week and a half's time, he's going to Israel first, and then he's going to Riyadh. And Riyadh is hosting a GCC meeting there, the president of the GCC. And our colleague, Jordan Fabian, asked, sir, are you going to ask the crown prince or the king for more oil? And the president said, that's not why I'm going there. And if I am going to ask, it's going to be the Gulf cooperation. But we all know there's only two countries, and you've already named them, Matt, that can actually have the spare capacity to bring a barrel on the market for the president, and that's the United Arab Emirates, and it's also the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I would also argue that if gasoline prices weren't hovering near $5 a ga gallon in the United States of America, President Biden would not be traveling to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in July. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern, our Washington correspondent, joining us from Madrid. Thank you, as always. Let's take a look at some of the stocks moving in pre-market trading in the United States here. Start with Micron Technology, because they came out with a pretty dim outlook. Some concerns here around what that might mean for spending broadly in the tech space. Remember, Micron is the largest U.S. maker of memory chips, so those shares are down just shy, let's say 3.6% there, um, which brings me to NVIDIA, because when you see a move like that from Micron, it kind of rip, has a ripple effect throughout some of the bigger semiconductor makers, and NVIDIA is a big 
player. Of course, it's also a major tech heavyweight in the S&P 500. But of course, for Nvidia, they're also talking about some pressure on game card prices as well as perhaps that decreased uh, demand for Bitcoin mining. Remember, Nvidia also uh, it kind of helps with some of the warehouse processing and some of the data mining uh, in, in the have helped with a lot of the cryptocurrency space. So that's extremely important when it comes to that exposure story as well as the impact on the larger benchmark. And let's take a look from tech to the other side of the spectrum, cruise lines in particular, because this week we've talked a lot about uh, Carnival Cruise Lines being under pressure. Remember, cr cruise lines right now are kind of this volatility play. Royal Caribbean this time, though, actually up 3%. In a sea of red, this is your best performing stock this morning, Anna. Yeah, that after an awful first half for the sector as a whole. One of our colleagues writing that cruise lines are sending some sort of distress signal. One to watch. Uh, coming up on the program, we'll talk to George Borey, Managing Director for Fixed Income Strategy at Allspring Globally, uh, Global Investments. As we've seen, Eurozone inflation hit a record. Once again, we will talk about those higher inflation rates and what they mean for strategy. Plus, Republican Senator Pat Toomey says the Fed needs more transparency. He spoke with Bloomberg's David Weston. We have the situation where the Fed uh, is basically stonewalling Congress. The, the regional banks, and to some, some extent the main Fed, are taking the position that what we do is none of your business. We're an independent agency. You can't really look very closely on what we do. That's outrageous. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kriti Gupta. Anna Edwards out in London. Now, Michael Burry, famous from the movie The Big Short, where Christian Bale played him very awesomely, um, has said on his Twitter account that um, we're in for it in the second half. He says adjusted for inflation, 2022 first half S&P down 25, 26%. NASDAQ down 34, 35%. Bitcoin down 64, 65%. He says that was multiple, multiple compression. Next up is earnings compression, so maybe we're halfway there. Lynn Thomason, Bloomberg Markets Editor, joins us now to talk about what strategists are saying about the uh, prospects for the second half. Lynn? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the strategists are far more bullish than, than Michael Berry. Um, you know, you're seeing people, some people starting to call for a rebound, looking at those cheap valuations. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard to not see this as a market that's been very good to be short. And with interest rates going up, you have to think some of those tech stocks still look a little bit expensive. Okay, so there's even some some things that don't even look cheap. So even if you think uh, so, so being cheap is not uh, is not an argument for for buying stocks in their entirety, perhaps. Then, Lynn, um, what about the earnings stories and what we're going to be looking for as we go through into earnings season? We haven't necessarily seen the listed universe being really gloomy about their ability to pass pass on higher costs. For example, it feels as if there are other legs to drop, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think in my mind, the real question for earnings season is how bad it gets in, t in terms of inflation and you know what companies say about inflation and whether they're able to pass on that pricing power or start to face that that margin squeeze will really be a good direction for how the market is going to perform and whether you know companies are going to be able to keep up the pace of earnings growth that we've seen. Well, speaking of that earnings growth and this kind of demand destruction, I feel like a lot of companies are just now starting to see materialize. Well, they warned us about this. They warned us about this going back to even a year ago. How much of this or shouldn't this, I should say, already be priced into the markets? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think there's obviously a sense of, you know, everyone warned that this was going to happen, but um, it's really until now that we're starting to see it and people are seeing higher prices at the grocery store and maybe thinking about, well, do they need to go on that vacation if it's going to be more expensive or, um, you know, looking for ways to cut back. So I, in my mind, I think this will be the earnings season that you really start to see things kick in. Lynn, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Lynn Thomason joining us with uh, thoughts on the markets. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go. That's the function uh, for you on the Bloomberg terminal where you'll find the market's live blog. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Kaylee Lines is off today. Now keeping you up to news, up to date with the news from around the world, here's the first word. The coronavirus has returned to the Chinese city where it first emerged. Two cases were reported in Wuhan. The first ones reported there in more than a month and then came just days after President Xi Jinping's symbolic visit where he reiterated the country's pursuit of a zero tolerance pandemic policy. The former Apple lawyer, once responsible for drafting the company's insider trading policy, has pleaded guilty to insider trading. Gene Levoff admitted he used his access to draft SEC filings to personally profit. He will be sentenced November 10th. And the co-founder of beleaguered crypto hedge fund Three Arrows Capital is seeking to sell one of his luxury homes in Singapore. CEO Zhu Zhu bought the so-called good class bungalow for $35 million last year. Three Arrows is one of the world's largest crypto hedge funds that now faces liquidation after failing to repay creditors. The U.S. college sports world has been rocked and it may be the only the start to UCLA and Southern California have agreed to leave the Pac-12 conference and join the Big Ten, a predominantly what? Midwest league. The move comes as the Big Ten is about to sign a giant TV contract and a shakeup that could lead to more movement of schools in the so-called Power Five conferences. Coming up, George Borey, Managing Director of Fixed Income Strategy at Allspring Global Investments. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. An ominous start to the second half of 2022. Stocks and U.S. futures are lower on recession fears. Big short money manager Michael Burry thinks we may be about halfway through the market's decline. China's President Xi Jinping defended his crackdown on Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. In a landmark speech marking the 25th anniversary of Chinese rule, Xi said the former British colony should focus on its economic development. And Vladimir Putin orders a giant oil and gas project transferred to a new Russian company that essentially forces out foreign partners, including Royal Dutch Shell. Putin's decree cites threats to Russia's national interests and economic security. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Kaylee Lines is off today. And Matt, we just said there in their headlines that things look bleak for risk assets on the first day of July. Welcome to the second half of the year. But that said, we're off our lows. And actually, European stocks now into positive territory. U.S. futures, yeah. yes, they're still negative, but again, off their lows. Yeah, I mean, I saw your map earlier, and it was essentially all green. Um, we are down in terms of S&P futures, but only two-tenths of 1%. Investors are buying bonds right now, maybe uh, because they want the perceived safety of government debt. That pushes the yield down below 3%. I know that's a level at least Tom Keen was watching when I saw him on surveillance yesterday. So we've passed through it. 29833 is the level now. We are seeing gains in NYMEC crude, which maybe not uh, so good for stocks, but at least that's okay for global demand, right? We must have some kind of confidence in the economy if we're buying crude up to 107.41. And Bitcoin bouncing back. Now, to be fair, this is just from midnight, and the swings uh, make it a pretty arbitrary time to uh, pick. But we're up 3.6% to $19,409, and it is a very correlated asset. So maybe we see pickups uh, a little bit later in futures and then into the live cash session. Critty, what do you see in terms of the pre-market movers? Well, a lot of red on the screen, just like you said. And this is important because one of the big movers here comes from the semiconductor space. Now, overnight in Asia, we saw the Taiwan index really take a hit. A lot of that semiconductor exposure. Well, a lot of this also has to do with right here in the States with Micron, the largest U.S. chip maker here. It actually is down. They had a dip outlook really bringing up the question how much tech spending is really justified in this era when we're talking about the slowing uh, decelerating global economy and as you have they kind of ripple effects across a lot of these semi companies but also Nvidia having its own story in the mix down about one percent this morning what's important here is that Nvidia is already looking at perhaps dropping prices when it comes to their game cards as well as decreased Bitcoin mining remember they provide chips for a lot of data warehouses that help with that process so of course they do have a slight exposure there down about 1%. And I have to add, talk about some deal news here as well, Anna. Kohl's down about 15% in the pre-market. This is important. Remember, Kohl's was up for sale, potentially in talks with Franchise Group. Now it looks like, according to reports, that Franchise Group is ending talks in terms of acquiring Kohl's. So we're going to keep you updated on that story mm. throughout the day, Anna. 
Yeah, where does M&A go in the second half of the year? Where do retail stocks go in the second half of the year then, Chrissy? Uh, back to Europe and a uh, focus on European stocks. European equity markets, Matt was talking about how the map looked green. Well, you can see there the eking out some gains here for European stocks. The stock 600 up by a tenth of a percent. We were selling stocks. We were weaker on stocks. Now we're buying. Uh, it seemed we were piling into bonds and now we're selling bonds and yields are going higher. So after, uh, after a, a period this week where we seem to be focusing more on retreating into fixed income here in Europe and putting aside inflation concerns and thinking more about growth. Well, we're certainly back to thinking about inflation this morning as we got that Eurozone print coming through with the inflation at another record. And so the Eurozone focused on that inflation story. Um, that's part of what we're watching out for here. Copper, interesting if we think about inflation and where the broader commodities go in the second half of the year. Well, copper was already negative for the first half, which actually was a bit of a standout because uh, a lot of the other assets in the commodity space had been moving higher, of course. 2.75% uh, weaker on copper this morning it dropped actually down below $8,000, just back over that mark. And just to underline where we are on the risk trade, we're down eight tenths of a percent on the pound. And that was really reflecting strong dollar and risk, uh, risk positioning. Uh, but there's also this talk of whether we might see a VAT cut, a sales tax cut here in the UK. That was in one of the newspapers today. And uh, I saw that cited around some of the pound news flow. Matt? All right, excellent coverage there. Now let's get to what's happening here. Republican Senator Pat Toomey says inflation is a bigger risk than recession. He spoke with Bloomberg's David Weston. Inflation is a bigger risk because it's here. It's real. And if inflation doesn't come under control quickly, it does enormous long-term damage. Is there a risk that we have a recession? Yes, I think uh, clearly there's a significant risk that within the next 12 months we'll have a recession. Um, my quarrel with the Fed and how it has managed monetary policy and the reason we've gotten in this dilemma is because I think there's a mindset at the Fed that sees inflation as a psychological problem rather than a monetary problem. Joining us now is George Borey, Chief Investment Strategist of Fixed Income at Allspring Global Investments. And George, let me start by asking your take on the odds of a recession. Do we see two quarters of back-to-back uh, -back contractions this year or into next? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, it's, there's a good chance that we see a recession. Um, as you've just mentioned, monetary policy is tightening. It's tightening in the U.S., it's tightening in Europe, it's tightening around the world. The only place it's not really tightening is in Japan. But with universal monetary policy tightening, growth is already starting to slow. And as policy gets tighter and tighter, the chances of demand, demand destruction, emerging goes up. So we're seeing a deceleration of growth we're seeing sort of the interest sensitive parts of the economy start to slow. And there is a good chance that as we get to the end of the year, we could have two consecutive quarters of negative growth. It's possible. George, good morning, and thanks for joining us here on set in London. Um, let me ask you about where we go on Treasuries and whether we've seen peak yield. I guess I'm talking here about the 10-year the uh, the, the ten yield at 3.5% in June and now down below 3% at 2.98. Yeah. I mean, what does the second half of the year look like? So the second half of the year for bonds should be much better than the first half. Sort of, <laughs> and that's not a terribly... Even it was the worst yes, ever. <laughs> not, a, not a terribly uh, challenging statement. But when we think about where bond yields should be, um, you know, sort of a nominal yield in kind of the 35 to 4% range, if you, if you think that inflation is going to stabilize or at least sort of ultimately retreat core inflation back down to 3%, you add a little bit of term premium, fair value is sort of in that, say, 35 to 4% range. So I think you can say that we're probably still in a bear market for bonds, but we're very close to the end of that bear market. The rally we've seen over the last two weeks, probably a bear market rally. Okay. Huge move in but there's still room to go. Okay, Chrissy, jump in. Yeah, well, if you already see that growth picture slowing, I have to ask, though, at what point do you start to see the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world essentially hit the brakes? Have we seen peak hawkishness? Christy, hawkishness is, is escalating into those inflationary sort of data prints. And inflation is, it's not dead yet. Inflation is still very much with us. We saw data out of Europe this morning. We're going to see some inflation data out of the U.S. I think the best we can hope for at this point is that inflation more plateaus 
rather than meaningfully declines. And, and just a plateau would be enough for, at least for central banks, to, si to shift the rhetoric. They don't have to be as aggressive. They don't have to lead the market materially higher. And they can allow rate hikes, which we're already in the midst of, to really start to take hold in the economy. We're looking for sort of new clearing levels where less liquidity in the system is more sort of naturally, if you will, more naturally kind of dispersed across the economy. We're in the middle of that process, and it's, it's not over yet. George, can I ask where you see value in the bond market right now? I mean, yes. especially after the drubbing um, that the asset class took in the first half, really across the board. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. It's been a drub, it's a drubbing technical term. Absolutely down, you know, 10 to 15 percent in bond markets around the world in six months' time. Not what a bond investor's typically, you know, sort of used to. But when we look at where both yields are on Treasuries, on corporate bonds, on structured product and securitized uh, types of investments, even in the leveraged loan market, you're getting paid to be a lender today. You're being paid both kind of a, a, a an inflation premium. You're being paid a term premium. You're now being paid a credit premium for default risk. And so the, the forward-looking returns for, for fixed income look much, much better. And, and that's where we think the second half of the year is going to be much more favorable to, to a fixed income investor. Your coupons, your cash flow that you're receiving now are at yield levels that should beat inflation over the medium term. And we're starting to see a meaningful uh, default premium built into uh, to corporate credit markets. So we're getting a little bit more constructive in here on the bond market. OK, and let me go back to the government bond market and thinking about you referenced the Eurozone data we had just yeah. this morning. I mean, just a reminder of this inflationary environment we're still in currently in 8.6 percent, higher than the survey and higher than the 8.1 percent we had uh, previously. This the number for the whole Eurozone, of course. Uh, some people here in, well, in Europe have been talking about a sort of operation twist trade within the European bond markets where you sell German debt, yeah. buy Italian BTPs in anticipation of the anti-fragmentation tool the ECB is bringing forward. Right. Is, I mean, are you looking at those kind of niche, well, maybe not so niche trades, but is that where your focus is or do you have other eyes, other things in focus in Europe? That, that's a really good point. And in playing the nuances of the, the sort of the unwind of monetary policy becomes actually an attractive trade. So maybe it is a twist trade or maybe it's looking at sort of the forward curves in Fed funds in the U.S. or thinking about the spread differentials between different markets. The U.S. has moved a lot. Europe probably still needs to move a bit more. Inflation levels are not too dissimilar, but the bond yield differentials are. And so as we kind of transition into the second half of the year, and, and bond values have materially shifted, you now get kind of paid to play those differentials. So, you know, we, we do see a lot of opportunities in bonds right now. Yeah, inflation at 8.6% in the Eurozone and the hiking cycle hasn't actually hasn't even, even started. Hasn't even begun, yeah. yes. George, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. George Bory uh, joining us there of All Spring. Coming up on this program, then President Xi marks 25 years of Chinese rule in Hong Kong with his vision for the future. We will have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking at a live shot of the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Sam Bankman-Fried, FTX founder and CEO. This is Bloomberg. Hong Kong enjoys a unique position, favorable conditions, and broad space for development. The central authorities fully support Hong Kong in seizing the historic opportunities presented by our country's development and in aligning with national strategies. China's President Xi Jinping speaking on a, uh, during a landmark speech uh, in Hong Kong, talking about the 25th anniversary of Chinese rule, of course. Joining us now is Ching Lin, CEO of Join in China, a firm that helps businesses establish themselves in China. And Ching Lin, it must have become, uh, well, you tell me, how challenging has it become? Or, or do you still have uh, clients trying to knock down the door, trying to t uh, tap your, you for knowledge about how to do business in China? How much enthusiasm is there in the West for getting involved in new relationships in China at this point? 
You know, quite interesting you asked me this question because I've been running Join China this business for over 10 years. And the steady kind of a flow and the steady kind of a demand to trade between UK and China hasn't, you know, slowed down at all. In actual fact, uh, since, you know, sort of the world opening up for the last eight months, I see much more demand, especially where I'm based in the southwest in Gloucestershire. The small business, smaller business is actually much more interested to collaborate with Hong Kong, with mainland China. So I would say that kind of a potentially, the reason being is because since the pandemic, the local business, especially I'm focusing on SMEs, they have a much more time and perhaps better understanding what is, mm. you know, about China, how does Chinese people, you know, communicate and how do they okay. think. And that is the reason, actually, interestingly, I see much more smaller business wanting to do business with Hong Kong and with China. Uh, but, but uh, Lin, if we look well, I was going to say, look back through the pandemic. Of course, China's still very much implementing those uh, COVID zero policies, feels very much still living with the pandemic. Has it not, has that not put businesses off, SMEs maybe who would have wanted to go to China and build those relationships, not able to do so because of, of tough travel rules? That's absolutely the truth, Anna. The reality is we are now living in a very, very fortunate. If we're talking about 20, 30 years ago, should the world shut down like this, you can't do physical traveling, that would have a very negative impact of building the business relationship and closing deals. But we're very fortunate, you know, we now have the technology and the people are used to using multi-channels to still collaborate, still keep that kind of a, you know, communication and dialogue to go away. The physical travel to go into China definitely has an impact on smaller business wanting mm. to work with their colleagues. However, I think the both ways, the Chinese side, their partners, we're talking about the Chinese counterpart, is making actual effort, as well as the UK side, this, the business is actually wanting to walk the extra mile to ensure the business relationship still maintained and stay in a positive way. Is um, is is the free speech or lack thereof um, an issue for Western businesses, Ching? I mean, it would be quite scary to imagine if you say something pro-democracy in Hong Kong, you could end up in a Chinese jail. That's a, that is a worry. I do have a smaller business come to ask me. My personal advice is, you know, the, the government is supposed to know what they are doing, right? However, you know, if they want to ask some advice from me, you know, I'm very happy to do so. But from the business point of view, this kind of information, when they picked up, they come to ask me, say, Chain, you know, can I say certain things? Can I do certain things? My advice always to communicate candidly and clearly. We're here for growth, business growth, and we must respect other countries' culture, policies, right. rules, regulations, same as, you know, the Chinese must respect us as well. So as long as we maintain kind of an open and clear communication, this type of, uh, what we'll say, setback should be able to be overcome. Well, let's talk about the financials here because Hong Kong is one of the most expensive markets in the world, not just in terms of real estate, but in terms of actually conducting business there. On top of that, it comes with the precedent of regulatory scrutiny that we've seen really amped up in the last year, especially in China. Why should a, a company, perhaps in the United States or in the UK or really anywhere in the world, in the face of this kind of decelerating global economy, choose Hong Kong of all places? I think Hong Kong has a strategically placed as do the financial hub of the world and then also as the most important connection point for the UK business to tap into the second largest economy, which is China. So Hong Kong actually used the British common law and then also they have been under the British rule for over 150 years. I've been traveling in and out of Hong Kong before 1997 and after very regularly. What I have seen is actually it is 
allow me to use that vocabulary, easier for the UK business to test in the water, to try out by working with the Hong Kong business, then maybe using that as a springboard into China. So I understand, you know, there's a lot of negativities regarding what's going on in Hong Kong after 25 years, which is milestone since the handover 1997. But we mustn't forget that Hong Kong's GDP has doubled since 1997. This is the fact. And then also the Hong Kong is still very well placed as uh, mm. the, the hub to connect to UK and as well as China. Okay. Ching Lin, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. CEO of Join In China, a business that uh, tries to connect uh, those in the West uh, with business opportunities in China. Thanks very much for giving us your perspective. Uh, coming up on the program, the costs of power generation are rising. We'll discuss the impact of inflation on renewable projects next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Chrissy Gupta in New York. Supply shocks and inflationary pressure are continuing to push up the costs of power generation. Joining us now to discuss is Amar Vazdev, Associate for Energy Economics at Bloomberg NEF, New Energy Finance. Amar, really nice to have you with us. So, it's, so lots of companies facing inflationary pressures and those companies that focus on renewable projects also facing inflationary pe uh, pressures. How great an impact have we seen there? Yeah, so with renewables, we're seeing onshore wind up about 7% um, year on year, um, and we're seeing on um, solar projects up about 14% year on the year. Cost of those, the is the cost it? of those technologies, yeah. yeah, installing those that new build capacity. So, so it's up quite a bit, um, and um, we'll see, we'll potentially see some rises further as well. So, Mara, I think it's interesting because, um, you know, everything is pushing those costs up. I read your report. Nice job. Um, you're saying it's not just, uh, you know, the the fuels, um, but also in, in some uh, energy production methods, but also the materials that make things, I'm assuming like, you know, the propellers necessary for solar um, or the panels, uh, sorry, the propellers necessary for wind, wind, wind or the panels, um, the, the, the shipment of those things, um, delays that they're running into, the same things that are causing inflation everywhere else are also causing inflation on pretty much every level in energy production. Yeah, that's right. So we're seeing um, the shipping costs out of China up about um, fivefold since the beginning of uh, 2019. We're also seeing uh, steel prices up and they peaked in 2H 2021, but they're still up by 78% um, since uh, 2019 as well. Um, and that's a key component in, in wind turbines and also for uh, the mounting structure for, for solar plants. So let's put this in some perspective here, spin it forward a little bit. I mean, this is a, a market that's crunched for sure. What kind of time frame are we looking at to perhaps get a little bit more balance? Yeah, so, so we're looking at kind of maybe the next three years, we might start to see um, prices or, or kind of um, that trend of declining renewable costs start to, um, start to um, undertake again, once again. Uh, but I think it's also interesting to look at where fossil fuel plants are today as well. Um, so a new build uh, coal and gas plant, they're up by about 9% year on year. Um, in relative terms, okay. it's, it's lower, but in absolute terms, slightly higher than... Yeah, so I was going to say, just briefly, Emma, how does this affect the transition then in the long run? I yeah. mean, if all of these parts of the energy space are facing inflationary pressures? Yeah, so I think in the, in the long run, it's, it's a temporary blip, a, a small bump in the road for renewables. We'll, Investor pressure on um, has has kind of has meant that the the debt cost for coal and gas plants will increase in the long run. Um, renewables will continue to get cheaper; they are cheaper right now, and so we'll we'll see that trend continue going okay. forward. All right, Amar, thanks so much for joining us. Amar Vazdav there from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Bloomberg NEF, talking to us about the rising costs of energy production. That's it for early edition. Be sure to watch the Boston Pops. Fireworks spectacular. It'll be live on Bloomberg Television, live on Bloomberg Radio, and live on Bloomberg.com this Monday, July 4th at 8 p.m. This is Bloomberg.